Hello everyone, my name is Garvin, and I read things and gabble wildly about them on the internet for your entertainment. Now, back in my Mystics of Atlantis video, I mentioned that some of the folks under discussion helped themselves to some ideas from a fictional novel called The Coming Race, which was published in 1871 with no named writer. Today, however, we know it was written by... Edward George Earl Lytton, Bulwer Lytton, First Baron Lytton of His Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council. Whew, not doing that again. Now, it was likely published that way because a sitting member of Parliament, not to mention a member of the King's Personal Council, didn't want his name attached to basically a lowbrow fantasy novel. And when we go over it, I think you might understand why. So, there's going to be some spoilers coming up on this story, but it is over a hundred years old, so uh, we're well past the limit here, I think. Our main character and narrator is actually an American in the story, though. He's born to a wealthy family, and he goes abroad when his father dies because he's seeking adventure before he returns to take over the family business. While exploring a new mine shaft with a friend, an unnamed mining engineer who, well, don't get attached to him, they find a passage that basically leads them to the Underdark. Now, for those of you who don't know what I mean by that, the Underdark is a concept from Dungeons & Dragons, a vast subterranean world of tunnels and caves and caverns full of monsters and civilizations and cultures and cities and peoples, most of whom are not very nice. It's a very fun setting. It's also incredibly dangerous, which is, if you're playing D&D, part of the fun. While our unnamed mining engineer dies, shocking, I know, and his body is quickly eaten by a large, nasty reptilian predator, our main character flees in terror into a vaguely Egyptian-looking city and runs into an incredibly tall man with artificial wings as his main garment. And throughout this interaction, the strain builds up on our main character until he has something of a hysterical fit when he sees this man use his artificial wings to fly looks up and realizes that everyone in this city is flying around on these artificial wings. And of course, he does the most Victorian manly thing he can do. He faints. Now, I shouldn't be so judgmental. I mean, this is someone who has seen a friend die and likely be eaten. He's found a civilization that shouldn't exist, full of people who can fly, and has realized he's probably cut off from home all in the space of, like, two hours. That's a hell of a shock to the system, right? But for those of you who have read my written reviews, especially for Fang's Giving, which was a special I did a few years back on vampires, Victorian-era heroes just seem wildly prone to passing out whenever they run into things that excite or frighten them. And I can only assume this has something to do with the fact that their houses are at least 70% made of poisonous material by weight, while their environment is soaked in uh, pollutions, both liquid, solid, and, you know, gases. And they're just not a very healthy group of people. Uh, this is what the FDA and the EPA inspectors protect us from, folks. Make sure you say thank you, and remember, they are all that stand between us and fainting every time we see something uh, alarming, because our systems are so overstrained with all the poisons in them that they can't deal with anything else. Anywho, back to the video. Uh, we want to stay on topic so that this can be a reasonable length video, unlike last week, right? Our main character, who we're going to call Tish going forward, because... That's what his uh, host named him. Learns that he has discovered the, quote, utopian, unquote, society of the Vrilya. 
these people fled underground thousands and thousands of years ago to escape a massive flood. Now, over the generations, some of them would learn to sense and control an energy source they call Vril, and this has caused physical changes over those generations in these people. For one thing, they are much taller and stronger than us, averaging above seven feet. The women are taller and stronger than the men, kind of a reverse of what's happening up here. And this just terrifies Tish. I, I, I'm going to be honest, he doesn't come off as particularly uh, strong or especially intelligent in this story. I don't hate the guy, but I'm not very fond of him either, considering his behavior. Of course, I'm also from a culture where the internet, just a couple years ago, was screaming, Step on me, big vampire mommy, when a certain video game released a super tall, powerful lady vampire antagonist. So, the gulf between me and Tish may just be down to the past being a foreign country. Back to our story, though. Uh, the Vrilia are also vegetarians, although not vegan because they drink a lot of milk and they do eat some cheese. But this has been going on so long that their teeth have changed to the point that they can no longer chew meat. And I'm going to assume they would have problems digesting it as well. Another change is that their thumbs are proportionately larger than ours and a bit more articulate. And there's a nerve at the base of their thumbs which forms their physical ability to sense drill and control it. Although for the most part in the modern era they use machines. Uh, everyone has a machine in the shape of, uh, shape of a staff that they use for most of their real work such as exploding things. Uh, there are other real powered machines they have though like house butlers, uh, farm and factory machines, and airships. There's a lot of flight for an underground society going on here. I just want to let you know that. To, to sum this up, the society basically runs on magic, and they're all wizards. And because of that, they don't need as much as we do in uh, raw resources, because they use Vril for most of their industrial and creation needs. Much of this book is devoted to world building. We learn that the Vrilya maintain themselves uh, by dividing into small self-governing units that number in the tens of thousands. And when the population exceeds that, volunteers are sent off into the wilderness to build new settlements. Uh, these communities exist in a sort of confederation. They don't fight wars with each other. They're all... Uh, self-sufficient when it comes to the production of food and medicines and things like that. But there's a certain amount of travel and trade, and people can move freely within this confederacy. Their government, in theory, is very hands-off, but it's made clear that no one has the right to refuse an order. The metaphor used is that every community is a large happy extended family, and you of course do not refuse the orders of your father. I'm going to pause while everyone hearing that just laughs their heads off. Take a second, it's okay. Uh, there's a supreme magistrate, and he selects the officers that keep the, the community running. You can't refuse appointment, and the magistrate also selects a successor upon retirement. Uh, there is no discussion of an impeachment process, so God knows what to do if he's not up to the job. And again, this is all justified as creating a happy, serene family and stating that anyone who isn't happy will be given the resources and means to leave and find a place where they fit and are happy. Now, I have had some people claim that the Virala live in a communist society, since the state does ensure that everyone gets the basics, like, you know, a place to stay, food to eat, the tools and the space to carry out a trade. But there's also the existence of social classes and private property. We have people who are wealthy and own land and pass that on to their children as an inheritance. So 
I'm going to say this isn't very communist at all. I will leave you all to duke it out in the comments over what we should call the society besides weird, because I'm comfortable just calling it weird. Now, I do have to admit to some dark suspicions here, because we are told all of this by high officials in the society, who also carry on how burdensome it is to be so rich and powerful. Almost like the guy who wrote this was a British noble close to the king. Nah. Because you actually have to work for a living if you're rich and powerful. And you have to buy things from craftsmen who just do it so they can have spending money. And I'm just really so the rich and the powerful are the ones doing all the work and the craftsmen are just playing games that just... You can tell an aristocrat wrote this. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm wandering off. Now, getting back to it, most of the skilled labor is done by adults. Uh, men dominate the crafts, but a vast amount of the unskilled labor is done by children, mostly overseeing those magic machines. Now, these children are paid. The money is put into a trust fund uh, for each child to access when they become an adult. And they don't actually start their formal uh, education until they hit about 12, 13. The wealthy get child house servants instead of robot butlers. Um, most of the farming, like the weeding and whatnot, is handled by children. And so is all of the fighting. Any, anytime there are predators that have to be killed or they confront a rival society, they send their kids out to fight. I, wow, yeah. Now, I generally don't approve of writers who think they're being clever by taking older stories with societies that are presented as benevolent and rewriting them to be secret, gritty, dystopian nightmares. But I'm staring on a Society that runs on child labor and is defended by child soldiers. I, this isn't even subtext. It's not even hidden. It's just right there. I, I feel like if your, quote, utopia, unquote, depends on child labor, you are not a utopia. You are the opposite. Uh, on top of the other stuff I've mentioned, this society has aged like milk left out in the Arizona summer. Good lord. But, getting back to it, sorry, sorry, um, there are gender divides and gender roles in the society because it was written in 1871. Of course there are. Uh, in this society, women dominate the sciences and academia. They're also most of the doctors. Interestingly enough, they're also uh, the pursuing or cult call it the courting sex. Uh, what that means in basic English is you don't ask girls out, they ask you out. And men are seen as less serious and thoughtful than women and more prone to crafts because men are more easily focused on their hobbies. So, you know, if you're a craftsman who makes watches and you spend time and effort learning to create works of art, your society in this situation sees you as an overwrought hobbyist to be indulged by your wife, who is the serious person. Now, uh, according to the story, women do have equal rights and protections under the law, which is easy to enforce because not only are the women bigger and stronger than you, they tend to be better at using Vril, so they can also blast you faster than you can blast them that would make oppressing the feminine gender harder if all women could cast fireball, I think. Just a personal opinion. Although, oddly, all the government officials are male. Huh. There are other civilizations in this underground world, uh, many of them made up of non vril users, and some of those civilizations are even explicitly mentioned to be democracies. But the Vrilya are dismissive of this and consider 
anyone who can't use Vril to be a barbarian, who should not be bothered with, but they should be wiped out to the last man, woman, and child if they inconvenience them in any way, shape, or form. And they also claim that they don't steal land from their neighbors, but they will say that if there's any threat to a newly claimed settlement, they will wipe the society doing the threatening completely out, and then settle the newly empty lands in turn. So, I find this suspicious. Do we still say sus? If we still say sus, this is highly sus. And if we don't, I apologize for using something that out of date. It's only in the last quarter or so of the book that we get anything resembling a plot. Has, again, most of the beginning and middle of the book is devoted to detailing the society, the beliefs, and history of the Vrilia, who make it a point of explaining how social harmony is more important than individual freedom. Your mileage may vary. The plot focuses, such as it is, around two young women falling in love with Tish. Because this is a Victorian novel, so the native women are always going to fall in love with the Victorian gentleman. God knows why. And because, of course, the Vrilia don't approve of race mixing with meat-eating non vril users, he sat down and told he has two options. He can marry one of the girls, Z. Uh, the other girl's off-limits because she's 16, he's in his 20s, and she's also the daughter of the High Magistrate. And the fact that he even considers marrying a 16-year-old girl is a heavy mark against him. Um... But he can marry Z, who is not the daughter of the High Magistrate, is a fully grown woman, and Tish is utterly terrified of, of her because she is so strong, she can pick him up and carry him around with one arm, and she can also cast Fireball. So, I mean, I can understand being scared of someone who can cast Fireball, but again, it's sort of like, Tish, take a breath. Uh... But if he marries Z, he has to agree to live in a sexless, non-physical marriage, because that's the only way to guarantee that Z does not get pregnant, which I find hilarious. Um, the reason I find this hilarious, and I'm going to kind of skirt around the YouTube rules here, is there are a lot of ways to be, let's call it, physically intimate without running the risk of present. Uh, pregnancy. So, this utopia, on top of everything else, has utter crap in the way of sex education, and is in desperate need of it. I'm not going to go further down this uh, rabbit hole, because I don't want to run the risk of YouTube's wrath, but yeah. Uh, Tish's other option? Death. Now, the Vrilia very much believe in a creator and an afterlife. They refuse to discuss any details of that because that would only cause social strife. So, this is a society with a religion no one's allowed to talk about. Not even with each other. Weird. However, they believe in it so strongly that one of Tish's friends, uh, a young lad in his early teens, is actually surprised that Tish would be afraid to die, and goes so far as to say, hey, listen, if this will make it easier, I'll go with you. And when Tish is like, what do you mean you'll come with me? He's like, we'll die together, it's cool. Well, uh, when they execute you, they'll execute me at the same time, we'll die together, and we'll, we'll just go into the afterlife as buddies. It'll be a giant road trip, it'll be great. And... This is actually Tish's finest hour in the story, if you ask me, because he turns around, he looks the kid in the eye, and he goes, No, you're not even 16. It would be terrible and beyond any hope of morality for me to ask you to die just to make me feel better. I want you to live. I want you to live and have a long, happy life. And if I must die, the only thing I'm going to ask is that you come tell me so I have time to prepare myself for it. And I'm going to be honest, this is one of the reasons I don't hate Tish, because he's he's willing to do at least this much. Dee, however, reveals herself as our true heroine. 
because she realizes that Tish could never be happy in a chaste marriage with her, and he's definitely not going to be happy if he's being executed. And she wants him to live and be happy even if it's not with her. I'm still kind of chuckling over this, you know, you guys can't ever have sex because then she'll get pregnant thing, but let me, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let that go. Um, anyways, Z goes, I understand why you couldn't be happy with this. I am going to help you escape and go home. Proving that she is honestly a better person than he is. Because if the shoe was on the other foot, I don't think he'd do shit, guys. So, she helps him escape. Tish turns around and, in another mark in his favor, looks her in the eye and says, I am sorry that I was not a good enough man for you. I really appreciate everything you've ever done for me. And, in another life, I would have been honored to be your husband. Which... You know, at least he did that much. Uh, in the last chapter, Tish reveals that he has written this story after many years of living a successful but lonely life has he never married. And despite being scared to death of her, Tish never found a woman who measured up to Z in his memory. But he is going to write this as a warning to all of us that someday... Someday, the Virlia will run out of room below ground, and then they will come up into the sunlight, and we will all be doomed. Doomed! Doom! Why, yes, I am having fun with this. Thank you for noticing. Um, back to the back to our conversation here. The coming race as a story does not age well in my book. The plot is thin. The characters are struggling to be two-dimensional in some cases, and the society itself is, wow, right? But there are two things that make this important. The one that's the most important to us in this video series about Atlantis is the real energy. Uh, it, an invisible, intangible energy field that can be tapped into to uh, grant telepathy, destroy things in your path, fly, power machines, cast magic spells. And this is how a lot of modern fantasy stories and games also treat magic. Uh, it has basically an intangible energy field. Uh, Helen Blavonsky would outright steal huge chunks of this in fact, claiming that the Atlanteans used Vril, she, she used that word, to power their magic in airships and to do the other wonderful things that they could do. And she wasn't the only one who did this. She was just the one with the most influence. There were also a number of Nazi societies that I mentioned in my Jackboot of Atlantis video. And they spent a large amount of their time and their money trying to find ways to detect and tap into Vril for the war effort. This turned out to be a giant waste, shockingly, and I'm okay with that because having a bunch of uh, genocidal totalitarian jerks to keep this within the YouTube specifications, wasting their time and money is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, the other thing that's influential here is the idea of the Underdark. Now, I couldn't find any direct links between Gary Gygax and the other founders of D&D in this book, but I wouldn't be surprised, uh, all things considered, if at least one of these guys had read this book uh, as a kid or as a teenager, and that had sort of influenced the creation of the Underdark or other elements of D&D. Um, but I could not nail down a um, real connection that I could point to, but I'm, I'm kind of leaving it out there as a, I think this is possible. Um, another thing that I find funny, now maybe I just have Atlantis on the brain, but we have a group of people who fled underground thousands and thousands of years ago to escape a massive flood, and we have 
a lost continent that was lost to a massive flood, and no one ever kind of clicked these two together and just said, oh, look, Atlanteans, underground, flying. I, I'm just surprised that never happened. But maybe it's just me. Now, I am going to link you to where you can read the story for free legally in the description below. So, please, feel free to read this story for yourself and tell me what you think. Well, this video certainly ran longer than I meant it to. Let me just say I hope you found it informative or at least entertaining. And if so, please leave a like, comment, or even subscribe. All of those really helped me in my eternal struggle against the Dread Lord algorithm. Terror beyond his name. If you'd like to support this channel, consider joining the ranks of my Everwise patrons. Doing so gets you access to extra content and a vote on the polls for upcoming content. And you can do all of that for as little as a dollar a month. Speaking of which, special thanks to Big Steve, my biggest supporter. As always, I appreciate you, man. Next week, we look at the avenging son himself, Namor. I hope you'll join me for that, but until then, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and of course, keep reading.